welcome. All this week, I have talked to you about some pretty spooky things and some uplifting things. I want you to know that um, <laughs> my wife actually told me one time we went to a friend's birthday party, uh, and uh, she said, I swear to you, this is exactly what she said. As we were waiting for them to answer the door, she looked at me and she said, don't you dare make anybody cry. <laughs> um, I, I have a tendency of bumming people out. Um, but I tell you, there are great, great, powerful things coming our way. But we have to um, get into shape. We have to be um, ready for it. Because miracles come when we expect them, when we deserve them, and when um, we understand that we are the Maker's hands. We are the instruments that He performs miracles with. All this week I've talked to you about downsizing and getting rid of some of the crap in your life. And I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of crap in my life. I've got a lot of stuff. My wife and I were walking around the house and we were like, I, what, how did we gather all of this stuff? I want to talk to you about turning that unneeded clutter into resources that will help either you be prepared for what may be a very tough road ahead of us, by taking that money and buying food storage, getting extra supplies on your, on your shelf, making sure that you're prepared, um, or joining me in a, another project. There is a great benefit to going through the purging process. A, the money at the other end. But what my wife and I uh, found out, Tanya and I, were, we, we went through the house uh, this weekend and we were sifting through the stuff that some of it has been packed away in boxes for years. And we looked at some of the stuff and some of the stuff we argued over, for instance, um, she insists that, that I sell the Woodrow Wilson doll. No, I'm not selling it. Why do we need a Woodrow Wilson doll? Are you kidding me? The Woodrow Wilson doll is the best and he... Just what is it that America stands for? He talks, too. This is the greatest, and it scares the neighbors. So uh, we had a discussion on a few things, and we're, but it was fun, and there was a flood of memories. Everything that we looked at, we were like, oh, my gosh, do you remember when we got that, or do you remember this? Or It will remind you about the good times and the bad times, all the ups and downs in your life. And it will remind you that even in the bad times, we are so incredibly blessed. We are blessed to live in a country that provides freedom of choice, freedom to choose your own path to self-determination, the ability to gather our own unique set of, of memories, if you will. I mean, I, I don't know how long it sat on the shelf before I came into the store. We gather our memories in whatever shape or size we choose. It has been said that you never really fully appreciate something until you lose it. I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I will tell you that is the understatement of a lifetime. I didn't understand. I didn't value my own word. I didn't value um, honor or integrity as an alcoholic, and any alcoholic will tell you, man, we are good at lying because we've lied to ourself for most of our life. If you can fool yourself, you can certainly fool somebody else. You never fully appreciate what you had until you don't have it anymore. When I realized I didn't have a soul in my life that believed me anymore, that I didn't have any honor or integrity, I wanted it back. It's been a very long, hard road to get it back. I don't know how many of us fully realize what this country means, what freedom means. The liberty and freedom unmatched anywhere in the world. I'm sorry, but we are not like the rest of the world. We do not want to lose it to appreciate it. Ronald Reagan said this, those who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. It is true. If we're lucky, our children will taste it again. 
But have we done enough to even teach them that it's worth something? Our children will not mourn for something they didn't even understand. What is our freedom about? Stuff? We don't even know our own history. Millions have died for what most of us now take for granted. Countless treasure has been sent, uh, spent to further the cause that I hope we hold dear. A greater amount has been, has been wagered all around the globe to destroy it. You've heard me tell this story a million times before. It's about Ben Franklin. He walked out of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, and a woman approached him and said, What have you given us, Mr. Franklin? He said, A republic, if you can keep it. Can we? That statement looms larger today than perhaps any other time in our history, maybe with the exception of the Civil War. Take the time to consider the values and the principles and the history of this country. What we were founded on, the values and the principles, the role that they play, not only in our country, but they play in our own life. It is my goal, I really truly believe with everything in me, that this audience will change the course of a nation and thus change the course of a world if we are our highest self, if we have if we've done the hard work and it's hard especially before the problem really hits. I ask you tonight to take an inventory of your own life Take the 40-day and 40-night challenge, a blueprint for national survival. I ask you, in 40 days, please, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It's, it's a four-step process. It's all outlined. It's all on the website. Please take that. Take a moment to find and center yourself. Take a moment to be thankful for the blessings that, that is the United States of America. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, it is also time to learn our own history and share it with your family. Talk to your children about the real story of the first Thanksgiving. Do you even know the story? It was in 1621. Pilgrims had come to this country in search of freedom, freedom to worship God from tyranny. They had a, a reason um, to be miserable, not thankful. 102 of them had made the trip to the New World, and on this day, only 53 of them remained. By all accounts, their stay up to that had been a disaster, and yet they all gathered to give thanks. They thank God for sparing those who remained and for bringing them to this new land. Half of them had died, and yet they thanked God. They thanked Him. For the Indian friends who provided much of that day's feast. What have we turned Thanksgiving into? Football, overeating, undoing our pants, sleeping on the couch and just going, oh, oh. So we we're Homer Simpson sometimes. At least I am. I challenge you to change this habit this year. Make Thanksgiving 2010 a return to the first Thanksgiving, a return to reflection, a return to appreciation for what we have, a return to thanks. Thanks for the blessings. We all may die. I, I, you know. They sat at that table and somebody had to look at each other in the eyes and think, he could be dead next week. We've lost half of them. But they found it inside of themselves to say, Man, aren't we blessed. Christmas is the next holiday. And Christmas is, the, uh, is another holiday that is strayed a million miles away from where it began. Early Americans weren't sure how to, how to do the holiday. I mean, they didn't know what to make of it. It was actually in Boston, did you know this? Outlawed in Boston in the late 1600s. Congress was on session um, on December 25th, 1789. They were working. 
ain't close anything done, down. The churches back then thought celebration of Christmas was tawdry and demeaned the sanctity of religion. Oh, if they could only see us now. Do you know when Christmas became a federal holiday and everything changed? 1870. 1870. And even then, things were so much different. There was no Black Friday. There was certainly no Cyber Monday. And if gifts were exchanged, they were almost always made of the homemade variety. If you were a kid in the typical American family, you might get one gift. Sometimes it was just sugar. And it would be the highlight of the entire year. Thanksgiving and then Christmas are part of what I call the trilogy of holidays. The third being New Year's. The reason why we always fail on New Year's resolutions is because we haven't been grateful enough to get down on our knees and be humble enough and then see the little baby Jesus and realize, holy cow, he's here to give me a second chance. I break these holidays down like this. Thanksgiving. Fall on your knees and give thanks. In the process, realize, again, Thanksgiving. Don't make it a compound word. Separate it. Give thanks. And the best way to give thanks is to give. Give back. Christmas, celebrating the birth of Christ, the symbol of redemption. Slate wiped clean. We can start all over again. The past, space-time. There is not, there's no space and time. It's space-time. It's a point in a map. What's past is past. That's where we were. Great. Where are you going today? New Year's is the one that we think gives us a fresh start, but it really doesn't. The New Year is just the starting line. These two are the ones that give us the opportunity to start fresh. I'm in the process of doing research for a new project that I'm working on for next year, and I'll tell you about it next year. And it's pretty ambitious. Um, I don't think anybody has ever tried it on television before, at least not on a show like this, not on cable news. And I don't know if anybody's going to watch, and that's okay. But in the process, the process of doing research for this, I stumbled across a story of a little town in Ohio called Wilmington that not very long ago, it was named one of the top places to live in America. It was a, quote, dream town, end quote. It was right out of a Norman Rockwell painting. It's a great town. In the course of 24 hours in November of 2008, Wilmington went from dream town to American nightmare when DHL, the shipping company, announced that they were closing their facility and they were laying off 9,500 people in a town of 12,000. A short time later, 60 Minutes dubbed Wilmington ground zero for the nation's unemployment crisis. Along with a number of other media outlets, they pretty much have pronounced this town dead on arrival. I grew up in a small town that everybody pronounced dead. I love small town America. It is the heart of us. Let me tell you something right now. I don't care what 60 Minutes says. Wilmington is not dead. It's not thanks to gritty and determined citizens. They have come to embody uh, and represent the true American spirit. They look out for one another. They're working together. They're rebuilding a little town they call home. And the government isn't involved. The churches are. There's a woman named Molly. She's a nurse. She's married to a firefighter. She couldn't stand to see the historic Denver Hotel shut its doors. Well, Molly's never run a hotel. I mean, look at this little hotel. She didn't know what to do. She didn't even have the money to buy it. So she went up to the owner and she said, you can't close the doors. What else? How can I help? What can be done to keep it open? 